Hi, welcome to this first lecture in anthropology. I will be introducing you to the field of anthropology in this lecture, and we'll be talking about culture, and then ending with your first uh, assignment based on the things that we look at today in the lecture. So this is lecture one. Let's begin. So this first slide is not really for your notes. It is a chance to introduce you to some ideas and to get you thinking in ways that will help us think about um, the discipline of anthropology. Um, so the year is 1928 and Coca-Cola which um, is familiar to Americans. Certainly we look at the drink and we're like, yeah, I know exactly what that is. Where I'm from in the South, Coca-Cola is actually slang for all soft drinks. So when people ask for a Coke, they mean I just need a soft drink. Whereas say in the Midwest, you say I want a pop or a soda. So it's familiar to us. But in 1928, Coca-Cola was looking to expand into Chinese markets. And so if you take Coca-Cola, this just the sounds that it makes, um, and then try to fit them into Chinese characters, um, you can get some pretty ridiculous sentences or phrases like bite the wax tadpole, female horse stuffed with wax. And that changes depending on the dialect of Chinese. Um, since Chinese is a tonal language, the way you pitch the sound makes a difference. Um, so ko at one pitch, la at another pitch, doesn't necessarily mean what you think it does. Um, and it's why people who grow up in tonal languages are actually very good um, with perfect pitch because they're trained from a very young age to distinguish words by the pitches they make. So Coca-Cola's got a really big problem here. How do we take our wonderful soft drink and we make it fit into uh, Chinese culture, Chinese society, and make people want to drink it so that they don't think it's something to do with wax tadpoles or horses stuffed with wax. So Koch spent quite a bit of time researching 40,000 Chinese characters to try to find a phonetic equivalent, something that would make sense in Chinese, but also preserve the name of the drink. So they came up with Coca-Cola, um, and that le in the end actually in Chinese is pronounced with a slight bit of an R in it. Um, I'm not by any means an expert in Chinese phonetics, um, but I read enough to understand that the idea here was that these characters, even though they don't really sound like our pronunciation of Coca-Cola, would better fit Chinese markets because they essentially would mean happiness in the mouth. Um, and that would be a much more positive association with this product. Uh, and perhaps Chinese folks would adopt it more readily, uh, given this, this new naming that they're using. So I want you to think about that for a minute. Um, something that is so familiar to us required a lot of work before it could be made to make sense in another culture. And all of the associations and thoughts even the symbol of Coca-Cola, that very well-known name um, in the font that we see it always in, those things don't readily translate to other communities, to other peoples in other places. And that's really the crux of what anthropology is about, trying to understand other people figure out their cultures, the way their minds work, the way their societies work. And very often that's difficult because things can get lost in translation.
Anthropology as a discipline could be defined as the study of humankind. Um, the word anthro does actually literally mean man, um, but you know it's the 21st century and we are not um, we're not going to be okay with that sexist focus. So humankind, people, would be at the core of the study of anthropology. And it's the study of their cultures and their societies. In its beginnings, anthropology was pretty racist. Um, and you find people with varying degrees of racism in their study. Sometimes they're just curious about a group of people, so they want to document their culture and their lives. Sometimes you see early anthropologists searching to find universal human laws, trying to uncover what is the sequence of human development. Many times that was in order to explain why some people are superior cultures, why some people are inferior cultures in their way of thinking. So there were a lot of value judgments in early anthropology um, where you find people grasping and grappling with different people around the world, but unable to shed their own belief in the superiority of their own culture. Of course, anthropology is um, not that way today, and anthropologists work really hard to understand cultures on their own terms. But there are many ways to do that. You know, anthropology has lots of subfields. Um, archaeology is considered a related field of anthropology. So archaeologists are studying cultures that are long gone, for the most part, not always, um, and trying to figure out from the material remains left by those cultures what life for those people was like. Biological anthropologists study uh, human evolution. Um, so if you're interested in primates and the development of primates over time, um, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, um, all the way down to us Homo sapiens, biological anthropology is uh, the field for you. There are forensic anthropologists. They study the human body as well. They're particularly interested in the physical structure of the body, so bones, um, the skeleton, the skull. They're very often called into work in crime scenes where maybe a, a skull has been found and they need to reconstruct what the person looked like. Um, they need to identify, you know, what are the characteristics of this person based on uh, markings in the skull. Is this a man? Is this a woman? Um, and so these forensic anthropologists um, are focused very heavily on the human body itself. Cultural anthropology is what we will be focused on in this class, um, and it's just the study of human cultures. A lot of times what cultural anthropologists do um, would be to look at the structure of a society. That is, how is this society organized? Who's on top? Who's on bottom? What are the roles that people play? Um, and how did those roles come to exist? A lot of cultural anthropologists are also interested in functions of societies, like actually how does the society work? What are the behaviors, the norms, the rituals, the roles that make this society come together and function as a group of people? So that's your brief look at the origins of anthropology. Obviously, we could say a lot more about um, its origins. We could say a lot more about subfields, and we will do so as we go along through this course. But for enough, for now, that's enough to get us started. As I mentioned, a lot of the early anthropologists were focused on um, 
ideas based in race. Um, assuming that races were biological, we know race is not biological, it's a cultural construct. So they went around picking skulls um, as representations of different groups of people. They were often pouring um, grain into them to measure, you know, how much grain does this hold? Well, this guy, clearly, these people are much smarter. Um, measuring the brow ridges up here in the front, this area right here, trying to make assumptions about the biological um, fitness of this group of people as well as their cultural um, intelligence. Um, and the ideas of many of these early anthropologists um, informed race-based policies in the 19th century about which peoples were inferior or backwards or uncivilized. Um, and so that is in the history of anthropology and anthropologists today have worked um, to avoid those traps by being much more aware of um, their, their assumptions, um, much more aware of genetics and evolution and human diversity so that they don't fall into this um, trap of comparing groups of people and making um, racist value judgments about them. So one of the things that we have to think about for anthropology is what kind of questions do anthropologists ask? Every discipline's like this. Um, if you've had me for a history class, you know that historians all ask the question, what are the causes, what are the effects? Um, because that's what historians are interested in. Um, if you're in a science class, um, they're gonna ask what made it work that way? Why did it happen? Um, if you're in other disciplines, you know that those disciplines ask questions about the nature of the world and the way the world works, the way the world is. So anthropology will be no different. Um, some of the core questions in anthropology that we're gonna grapple with over the course of this semester um, have to do with our relation to what we study. You know, how do you study a culture that isn't yours? You know, what, think about it, if you were an outsider and moved into Bexley, just think about that outsider point of view and trying to get to know and understand Bexley culture. Because it's a different place. It's a unexpected place uh, for many people <clears throat> to come to grips with what does it mean to be a resident of Bexley. Another problem we grapple with is do we even understand all the aspects of the culture we are in? You know, to what extent do you really understand and can see all the aspects of your own culture? Um, or is you know, your human vision limited and so you only can see so much of the world around you? How do we accurately describe a culture and how that culture works? You know, very many times, a culture is understandable from the inside by the people experiencing it. And then an outsider has to figure out, okay, what words can I use to describe that for other people who don't see that culture from the inside? And that's not always easy to explain, you know, what a culture looks like to an outsider. Um, how do we keep our own cultural assumptions from influencing what we read in other people? We as a people exist in a culture and we bring our culture to um, the table every time we're trying to understand somebody else. We're filtering their experience through our own. That's the nature of how the brain works. That's the nature of the way we are designed. If you've had me for psychology, you know we've talked about that. Um, we process from the top down through our own experience and through what we know. So these are going to be some core issues that anthropology will grapple with over time. We will see that throughout this course as we try to figure out um, the culture of ancient Egypt, a culture that is so very alien to our own in the way they work, 
and their assumptions about the world, and yet some things seem very familiar to us. So far, we've used the word culture quite a bit without actually jumping in to um, define it. And I think it would probably be very helpful to come up with just a brief definition, even if um, we add to this definition or we change it and modify it as we go. Um, so this is a definition that's in two parts. First part is the what of culture. There are ideas, practices, symbols, histories, behaviors, rituals, traditions, and materials. So notice culture can be what we think, it can be what we do, it can be how we represent our world, it can be the, the history that we have, you know, as part of our culture. This is the history of our people. It can be the behaviors we engage in. It can be our rituals and traditions. So maybe church, maybe a tradition like having afternoon tea. It can even be the materials that we build into our lives, the physical things that we have. Um, so that's the first part of the definition. It's the stuff part. The second part of the definition is what, what culture does. So in, in other words, it's function. Culture binds people together. So it takes a group of people who share these ideas, practices, symbols, histories, behaviors, rituals, traditions, materials, and it binds them together in a society. So we share a culture. I can say, would you like a Coca-Cola? And you don't look at me and go, oh, I don't want a wax tadpole. Culture helps people develop their identity, so it shapes who we are. Um, I have several cultures. I'm a Southerner, so born in the South, my first 30 years of life in the South. So very much Southern culture and Southern life is part of who I am. Um, I am also a gay man, which means that my culture is um, informed by a community of other people like me with its history and its shared traditions and rituals. Um, I am a musician, so I have a culture that um, comes to me from the music world, uh, particularly my church background, so that influences my identity. All those things come together in me. So think about yourself and the culture that you're in and how that shaped who you are. Culture helps humans adapt to their environment. Um, at its very basic and earliest, culture has the function of making us survive. So we have rituals, traditions, and behaviors that keep us alive. Culture explains to us how to behave. Um, so it teaches us the rules of what living together is like so that you don't make a very socially awful thing uh, in public where people go, ha, 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 you don't know the culture. We're laughing at you. Um, culture helps explain what life means. It gives meaning to our existence. So it says to us, well, this is what happens to you, and here's what you should do about it. Here's how you should feel about it. And then finally, culture... Um, are all of these things being reproduced over time? So we say that a culture um, is something that is reproducible. It can um, continue to appear over generations of time. Rather than merely happening once and then just going away. So this is a pretty big definition um, of things that culture is, followed by things that culture does, we are going to modify, amend, we're going to look at this again and again and again and again, because it's a very key concept for us in anthropology. So don't be surprised if this takes a while to sink in and settle in for you. We're going to come back to this over and over.
So your first assignment. Oh, this is so exciting. So we're going to transport ourselves back to the year 1897 and pretend that we're all interested in ancient Egyptian culture. We're archaeologists. We're trying to figure out who these people were by digging up their stuff from thousands of years ago. So it's a dig in a temple. And we find a whole bunch of artifacts as we are digging. One of them is a stone. The stone is 25 by 16 inches. So it's pretty big, actually. It's gray. It's sort of, sort of a light grayish green color. We're brushing the dirt off of it. And we notice that there are images carved on its surface. In fact, when we're looking at the image, we notice that they're raised. That means the background was cut away, leaving this raised picture across the surface. So it's our job to figure out what this is. It's our opportunity to study a culture that's foreign to us and ask ourselves, what does this stone tell us? What can we infer from its carvings? How do we make sense of the strange images? What do we think the stone was for? So if you will head over to Canvas and find the assignment, I will provide you images of the stone for you to look at. I would like for you to resist the temptation to look up the artifact and try to like figure out, you know, what it is. Try to enter into this, this assignment as an outsider attempting to make sense of a culture that you are not familiar with. So let yourself be transported and wonder at this image. Give yourself the opportunity to try to describe it. If you get nothing else out of the assignment, maybe you just simply describe what you see. People, animals, what do you think's going on? Um, so I look forward to seeing what you have to say about this image. Um, and I'll meet you on Canvas.